Hello guys, welcome back. It's your boy Adam Ernest back in with another video and in today's video we'll be covering signs of parasitic infections, the infections that have worms. There's different type of worms, different type of parasitic infections that can enter your body. And in today's video we'll be going over the signs. That's including the symptoms, the causes, the complications, the danger level, um, and much more. So you guys will all be seeing Everything you need to know will be on this video about parasitic infections. If you or someone is experiencing these, you come across the right time at the right at the right place at the right time. Because today we're going over everything, every single parasitic infection of every type of group of those will be on this video. What are the causes? How what to say to the doctors to learn more about it and much more. So if you guys want to learn more, continue watching this 40 to 30, 30 to 40 minute video of everything you need to maybe shorter if I could get them all in. But again, we are doing this video. So if you guys are experiencing symptoms, you guys can know what to expect. So here we go, guys. We are talking about symptoms of parasitic infections. Now, before we begin, make sure to subscribe and like the video. Moving on, everybody. The danger scale of this. Now, the danger scale is a new thing I'm adding to here. It tells you how dangerous they are based on their overall symptoms, including complications. This will be out of five. Will be danger scale of three, as some of the complications here are going to be lifelong complications. That's right. You may be experiencing chronic pain with these for complications. So any of the symptoms you're experiencing now with this, depending on what it is, which we'll be talking about a crypto one coming up in a couple, uh, well, coming up at the end, but the danger scale will be for three. The complications are pretty bad, but then you can also have complications that last a long time. We'll not say lifelong, but it may feel that way because they are going to be there for at least a few weeks to months, depending if you are immunocompromised. So here we go. Sign one will be bloating. Some worms choose to live in the gut, so digestive problems are common. This includes excessive gas, which can lead to bloating. So again, there are going to be parasitic infections that tend to go over multiple parts of the body. Now, they can spread to other parts of the body as they move throughout your body, because again, they feed off of your nutrients to survive. So again, that's like different worms, different worms, every type, what the freak? Different worms have different things that could cause it. So, again, bloating will be one of them because it's going after your intestinal tract. Sign two will be diarrhea. Diarrhea is one of the most common issues with your digestive health is out of balance. So, if your digestive health is out of balance, it can mean the flu, it can mean infections, but most likely, not most likely. I mean, there are other many causes that are more common than parasitic infections, but yet these are still common. But... Parasitic infections is another one you want to know because, like it says, diarrhea. So if you have diarrhea, it depends because, again, one of the reasons that you have diarrhea is because it's attacking your digestive system. As it moves throughout, it will basically feed off of your intestines. In my opinion, I think that's what, but more the common more way it's going to be is that, that it can basically cause diarrhea because it is going to be in your digestive tract. It's an irritant. It's not supposed to be there. So if it's not supposed to be there, you're going to have diarrhea with it because it's not going to it's not going to do so well inside your intestines. Again, that can cause stomach issues because again, the worm or the parasite can do some damage to your intestines. So therefore, you're going to have diarrhea and that's basically your body's way of trying to remove the irritant or the parasite from your body. Now, if you do see something that looks like a worm or a string in your poop, most likely it could be from something you ate. It could be from fat. But another thing it could be from, um, it could also be from a parasite, parasitic worm. So if you have a parasitic worm, you want to look for a big worm inside your poop. That worm will actually depend if it's actually a worm or not. You may want to go to the doctors immediately because a parasite can do more damage than good. It will never do anything good for you. All right. It will probably teach you a lesson that you should wash your hands or stay more safe. And again, it can even occur with people that are the safest of safe which means they could be at home like some of the people that are scared of COVID to this day, and they could still end up with this because there are multiple ways. But staying at your home, I don't think you'd likely to get this because you need to be traveling out and about doing more things than what I'm going to be talking about in this video as they are not appropriate to be said on this video. Moving on. 
Sign three is going to be nausea. So when you have an unwelcome parasite living in your gut and stealing crucial nutrients from your food, feelings of new nausea are common. So your nutrients you get from the food, they will feed off of the food that you get into your body and they will cause nausea because it's not giving you the right nutrients. And again, when you're having this, your body knows something's not right. So it will cause nausea because again, another way you can leave anything for a parasite, okay, any infection, the one way they can come out of your mouth is by either, you know, vomiting or out your butt, which is pooping. I know this is going to be an inappropriate video, because every, but this is exactly what goes on. You literally have nausea and vomiting slash diarrhea with parasitic infections. Any infections are going to bring the symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. They're all very miserable, and these are some of the symptoms that can be chronic for the next couple of months to weeks if you have the crypto version of this parasitic uh, family. Moving on. So, from sign number four is stomach cramps. Abdominal pain or cramping can be common with parasitic worms. They can leave the excess of gas and excess, excess, excess gas and irritate your digestive tract. If that does happen, it will indeed lead to some very, very devastating symptoms if you don't like vomiting and you have metaphobia, which if you're a metaphobic, you are a fear of vomiting, then this will definitely be one of those you do not want to mess with. Um, the sign number five will be changes in appetite. This can go away either. This can go either way. Some people find themselves more hungry. After all, worms still crucial nutrients that your body needs to thrive. On the other hand, some people experience reduced appetite. This could be changes to feelings of not. This can be due to feelings of nausea that accompany worm infestation. So that's right. There could be more than one worm in your body because again, worms can reproduce. And they can basically reproduce inside your body and can basically replicate themselves to multiple accounts. But again, the most chances of that happening when you have the antibiotics or the treatment that you're supposed to be getting that the doctor recommended you, it's highly unlikely, but there is still that one slight chance you cannot rule it out as something that's not going to happen, but we can rule it out as, as a very slight chance, not a number 0% chance. It will be a very low but still yet there percent chance that will cause some significant amount of damage and could bet maybe spread either, either way. Because again, parasites are more, um, they're more smart and more sophisticated, sophisticated, whatever the word means, sophisticated than any other thing. Okay. These are more intelligent. They have ways of escaping stuff. So yeah. Uh, moving on, number six, fatigue. Sign, uh, sign number six will be fatigue. Your body needs key, key nutrients from food to produce energy. Since worms hijack many of these key nutrients, they can leave you feeling tired or sluggish. So when you get up in the morning and you start to feel very tired and you eat, your body is get you, giving you that food and it's going to be basically getting nutrients from them, so absorbing the nutrients that they have in the food, no matter no matter what food it is. It could be from any any food, even junk food like candy have nutrients in them. And again, they have sugar. Sugar is transferred into fat or into energy, or in basically half of it's transferred into energy or fat. And that energy you get will make you feel more either tired, or that depends if you don't eat for a while, or it can make you feel very, very hyper. Sign number seven, itching. This one may sound surprising, but people can have allergic reaction to worm larvae. And these allergic reactions can include uncomfortable itching. Watch closely if you have any of these seven signs. While signs can appear while many other conditions, they are also common of a parasitic worm. And a simple way to flush out any potential tapeworms and other gut worms, then you should take a look at this unique flush worm flushing method. It's simple, all natural, and takes seconds a day from the comfort of your home. They, they won't find any harsh detox here. The, the video explains everything. So I took all this information off of a website. I know it's not right, but it's for the video. So anyhow, it's not like I'm doing a school presentation. I'm allowed to do this. This is all off a uh, Cleveland Clinic medical site that, and I took all this information, copy, pasted by copy and pasted because I want to be there for everybody. I want to be a doctor. And again, I'm not a doctor. So like I said, don't take my stuff for word. I am just someone who is a medical researcher that is going into a class to study researching medical 
um, the couple days from now when I'm in the 10th grade, I go into this special school that I get to go to to learn more medical. Um, there's other classes you could take up there. I'm not going to give the name away. It's not anybody's business and it's not appropriate because that's giving away private information that I'm not going to do. But like I said, I'm not going to show the video because, again, I've got one video taken and deleted off of here because it was too inappropriate. So I learned my lesson from it. So if you guys want to go learn that video or watch it, the video will be in the description down below or the website so you guys can learn more about whatever this video shows. Um, now, there are three main types of parasites that can cause infections in humans. Protoza, uh, ec ec ectoparasites, and whatever helimili Helminthus, or however you pronounce that name, these are very hard, con you know, con confusing words to say, by least. Uh, but protozoal infections. Protoza are single celled parasites that can affect your blood, intestinal tract, brain, skin, eyes, and other parts of your body. So, yes, these can affect brain, which is highly, highly dangerous and with very, very high fatality rate if untreated, no matter what condition it is of the brain. Abscess, infections, parasites, brain aneurysms are all dangerous. Some are more dangerous than others, but they're all equally amount of dangerous when it comes to untreated medical complications. Um, Helimith infections is a general term for parasitic worms. Um Scientists further classify them as flukes, tapeworms, roundworms, and horny head, thorny-headed worms. Both adults and immature can affect you, usually infect your intestinal tract, but they can also affect your skin, brain, and other tissues. Echoparasitic infections. Echoparasites are insects and arcanids, spider-like bugs that burrow into your skin and live there. These include ticks, mites, lice, and fleas. That's right, ticks. Mites, fleas, and lice are all parasites. They usually don't affect other parts of the body except for the skin, like the hair for t uh, lice and ticks for like anywhere on the, like down on like the lower parts of your body, like your la ankles, your legs, because that's technically they live in tall grass and stuff. And when they attach to you, they can cause Lyme disease and possible death. Um, what are the most common parasitic infections? So, Millions of people around the world get parasitic infections every year. The most common parasitic infections include malaria, to toxoplosmosis, head lice. The, this one right here, the G-I-A-R-D, is a S word, and I'm not going to go over. It's an infection that you get if you... I'm not going there. Penworms. Other example of parasitic infections include uh, crypto, which we'll be talking about that one because that one's been pretty much blowing up with a lot of cases which, uh, recently, and they are very, very, probably one of the most on this list, the most contagious one, most likely. Um, I'm not going to say too much because I don't really know if they're the most contagious, but any of these are highly contagious because parasites can spread from person to person depending on what it is. And yes, they can, no matter if they're in your body, they can spread because again, if you have contact with human saliva in your own mouth with the affected person it will spread to you because that parasite has already affected their saliva and they can actually be so small and like really really small to the naked eye that they can access your body and you can become infected as well um but yeah tapeworm infections now these words i have no idea how you pronounce but again those are those. So symptoms and causes. Symptoms of parasitic infections. Symptoms of parasitic infections depend on where in your body you're infected. Some common symptoms include fever, muscle aches, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Depending on where you're infected, you might have neurological symptoms like seizures. So those can really do a lot of damage because, again, during seizures, if you don't know, the reason why they have to put you on your side is if you, you constantly shake up and down, you constantly shake. And when you do that and, you, and you're like on concrete or on any type of ground, your head can go up and down. And that impact of your head going up and down as fast as it does with a seizure episode, um, it can cause your brain to get severely damaged. So you can have like concussions and brain damage. And that's mainly because if you're choking on your own saliva and stuff when you have seizures and you turn you on your side, you can't like choke 
on your saliva as you can probably you can still choke but it's not as likely because again when you're on your side you're not gonna like take all that saliva because again when you're on your side on your side the saliva will probably come out of your mouth most likely and when you're laying on your like just flat out that could most likely go down in your throat and lead to suffocation which can lead to brain damage and coma another one is is if you can you can bite your tongue it's super hard because your mouth is like in a very you can, your mouth also has an episode as well because your your mouth is constantly moving and stuff with this and your throat's constantly moving so with this with your tongue you can actually eventually with an ep episode of a seizure episode you can bite down so hard with enough force that it will cut your tongue off you can literally bite your entire tongue off and choke on your blood and suffocate you so that's another reason why a lot of people take seizures uh very high and you know very very serious because they are very dangerous if they're not treated fast enough. So another one is severe headache, disoriation, skin symptoms like redness, itching, rash, or sores. Uh, yeah, sores. Um, sometimes parasitic infections don't cause any symptoms, which can be a deadly thing. Because again, you have to know symptoms in order to know there's something wrong. Again, there are many conditions that don't cause symptoms at all. I mean, there are some conditions that are very dangerous that cause symptoms, but there are some cases, not all, but low. Like we said with the other thing that we can't roll it out is you're not going to get a couple parasites after having medication done. This is just like it. It's a very low chance that you're not that you're going to have no symptoms at all. You're going to have symptoms, but that's not always the case. You see, most people don't think they can get some symptoms if it says most likely there will be no symptoms. And there's, there's sometimes or there's conditions that are the other way around. You could get symptoms or you cannot. So it all depends on how everything goes. So yeah. Ah, uh, how do you get parasitic infections? You can get parasitic infections from drinking contaminated water or getting it in your mouth, eating uncooked meats, eating contaminated food like food washed with contaminated water, mosquito bites, tick bites, flea bites, or other bites from insects that carry parasites. Contaminated surfaces like contaminated dirt and soil. Now, there are other ways you can get it, but those are inappropriate, and we're not going to be talking about those on this video. What are the risk factors for parasitic infections? Some parasitic infections, like pinworms, are common all around the world. Many other parasitic infections are more common in rural, rural, rural areas of the world without developed sensate, uh, sanitation systems. People who are at higher risk for parasitic infections include young children and their parents, or care and their parents or caregivers, people with compromised immune systems. This include people with here we go HIV or AIDS, cancer or those in immunocompromised immunocompromised immuno medications. So, diagnosis and test. How are parasitic infections diagnosed? Providers diagnose parasitic infections by looking for parasites or signs of parasites like their eggs and body fluids or tissues. To test for your parasites, a provider may take samples of your poop because, again, like I said, there might be a worm inside your poop that tells. Because, again, if it's in your intestines and you start to poop it out, it can get shoved in that poop. And when you poop it out, they could show the worm inside the toilet or in your poop. Blood, as some can have also affect the blood, skin or other infected tissue. There, all of these are going to be different types. So some can affect the intestines, which would be poop. Some can affect the bloodstream, which would be for the blood test. Symptoms or other infected uh, skin or other infected tissue, which can some can affect skin like mites, ticks, mosquitoes. I think well maybe not mosquitoes, but other ones too. Phlegm. Some can affect like your throat and stuff, uh, fluid around your brain and spinal cord because some can affect your spine and well, it can like lead to your spine if it goes to your brain and stuff. So CNS fluid, which can be known as cerebrospinal fluid. Some of those can also lead to a cerebrospinal fluid leakage, which I talked about that uh, way a couple, I think a couple months. If not, I'm making, I'm making, a, I'm making a brand new updated version of that video um, later on this year. So stay tuned for that video. Um, So, a provider may also use other tests such as, as, such as x-rays, MRI, or CT scans to diagnose a parasitic infection depending on your symptoms. 
So, do, how do you know if you have a parasitic infection? Symptom of parasitic infections can be similar to many other infectious diseases. The only way to know for sure if you have a parasitic infection is to have a provider evaluate you, which is to like look at you, like test you out with stuff. Management and treatment. How are parasites infections treated? Providers use different medications to treat various types of parasitic infections, include antiparasitics, antibiotics, antifungals. Um, sometimes you may need a combination or of different medications to cure the infection. The infection. Your provider will select a treatment the best that's best for the specific type of parasitic infection you have. Um, how do you get rid of parasites in your body? Most parasites will only go away with medication or a combination of medications. Provider tests some skin infections, lice, and mites with medicated lotions or shampoos. Uh, prever prevention. Can parasitic inf infections be prevented? Following a few precautions can reduce your risk of parasitic infections, including wash your hands frequently. It's especially important to wash your hands when preparing food before eating. After going to the bathroom, after changing diapers, don't swim when you have diarrhea. Wait until you have di had, haven't had diarrhea for at least two weeks before swimming in a public pool again. Public, uh, practice safe food habits. This includes storing food properly, eating, heating meat and poultry to a safe temperature, and washing or peeling fruits and vegetables before eating. Pro to protect yourself from bug bites, wearing protective clothing, use bug spray, and sleep under mosquito nest netting if necessary. Be an informed traveler to learn more about infectious diseases in your destination that you may need to take special precautions against. Some precautions may include taking propylatic medications before you get sick or get back getting vaccinated. What can I expect if I get a parasitic infection? What you can expect with a parasitic infection depends on what kind you have, how severe it is, whether or not you have compromised immune system, how well you respond to standard treatments. Some parasitic infections respond well to medications, but uh, some infections can last for a long time or keep coming back. Ask your health care healthcare provider what you expect in your specific situation. When should I seek when should, when should I see my health care provider? See your health care provider if you have symptoms of a parasitic infection. Let them know if you recently traveled, could have been bitten by a tick, mosquito, or other bug, even if you didn't remember being bit, swam in water that could have been contaminated, ate or drink something that could have been contaminated. When should I go to the ER? Go to the emergency room if you're experiencing any symptoms of the of severe illness. Fever over 103 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, seizures, confusion or disorientation, yellowing of your eye or jaundice, dehydration symptoms like extreme thirst, peeing very little, weakness and, and high heart rate. When question should I what question should I ask my help my doctor? It may be helpful to ask your health care provider, how did I get this infection? What are the treatment options? Am I contagious? How long until I feel better? How can I take care of myself at home? What new or worsening symptoms should I look out for? When should I follow up with you? What is, here we go. What is crypto, is part of doses? Oh, I can't even pronounce that. So often called crypto for short is a highly contagious intestinal infection. It results from exposure to crypto parasites, which lives in the intestines of humans and other animals and are shed through the stool. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC trusted source, Crypto affected about affects about 750,000 people per year. Most people recover within a few weeks with no problems. However, the watery diarrhea, nausea, and abdominal cramps that come with the come with the infection can linger for some people, which means you do need to stay severely hydrated if you are going to have if you do seem to have these continue and linger because that can lead to dehydration. So you got to look out for that as well with this. So it's not a very fun sight. It may not be that dangerous, but it is going to be severely, and I mean severely, uh, painful and miserable. Um, for your children, for young children or people with a weakened immune system, the infection can be particularly dangerous. The CDC trusted source reports that crypto is found in every part of the country and even around the world. Causes of crypto. A person can develop crypto after coming in contact with contaminated feces. This exposure happens by swallowing recreational swimming water. Any people contendrate in water 
Swimming pools, water parks, hot tubs, lakes, and even the ocean can contain crypto. Other serious infections can be contracted in these environments. According to the National Foundation for Infection Diseases, Diseases, crypto germs are a leading cause of waterborne disease in this country. Young children who often splash and play in water are susceptible to the infection, which peaks in prime swimming season in the summer and fall. The CDC trusts worse. Trusted source reports that millions of crypto parasites can be shed in the bowel movement of just one infected person, making crypto highly contagious. And because the parasite is surrounded by the outer sh- an outer shell, it's resistant to chlorine and other disinfectants. Disinfectants. The parasite can live for days, even in pools properly treated with chemicals. Crypto germs can be spread through hand and mouth contact. They can be found on any surface that may be contaminated with infected feces. Because of this, the infection can be transmitted by playing with contaminated toys, touching bathroom surfaces without properly washing your hands, handling animals, drinking untreated water, touching dirty diapers, handling unwashed, produced, grown, and contaminated soil. Symptoms of crypto, the telltale signs of crypto include frequent and watery diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, stomach cramps, and fever. Risk factors for crypto, anyone who comes in contact with contaminated feces run the risk of contracting crypto. Children under the age of 10, uh, then 10 years, often get sick with the infection because they're most likely to swallow swallow swimming water. water. Others who also are infected of uh, crypto include ch- child care work- ch- workers, parents of infected children, animal handlers, people exposed to undrinking, untreated drinking water, such as travelers to undeveloped countries, and campers or hikers who may drink from streams. How crypto is diagnosed? If your doc- doctor suspects crypto, they send a sample of your stool out to a lab for testing. Multiple tests may be may have to be viewed because the crypto organisms are very small and difficult to see under a microscope. This can make infection difficult to diagnose. In rare cases, your doctor may need to sample tissue from your intestines. A person with crypto needs to increase fluid intake to combat the dehydrating effects of severe diarrhea. If the dehydration persists, or becomes worse, a person may be hospitalized and give intravenous fluids. Your doctor may prescribe the anti-diarrheal drug nitazidine, or how to pronounce that. It's only effective in people with healthy immune systems. People with weaker immune systems, such as those with HIV, may be given drugs to boost the immune system as a way of fighting the infection. Preventing the infection, the best way to avoid being infected with crypto and contributing to its spread is to practice good hygiene, trusted source, Teach children good hygiene habits while they're young. The CDC recommends you scrub your hands with soap and wash for at least 20 seconds in the following cases. After using the bathroom, changing a diaper, or using others, or helping others use the bathroom. Before eating or cooking, after handling an animal, after gardening, or even if you, even if you use gloves while carrying for someone who had with diarrhea. The CDC also recommends the other tips for preventing crypto infection. Stay at home or keep young children home when you are when you or they have an active case of diarrhea don't drink unfiltered water show shower before using recreational swimming facilities to wash away any potential crypto organisms on your body don't swim pool water don't swallow pool water wash all produce before eating it uh, peeling the skins will also reproduce will reduce your risk taking cho- young children at the pool to the bathroom frequently. Change children's diaper often. Stay clear of the water if you or your children have diarrhea. Stay out of the water for a full two weeks after the diarrhea subsides. Crypto is in a common intestinal infection, and other, especially in summer when the many facilities, most people with a healthy immune system. Uh, from crypt- recover week from crypto without any problems. But for others, the infection and its symptoms wax and wane. For others, it can provide deadly wa- washing and avoidance of re- deadly. Two of the best ways to pre- getting spread the highly cont- contagious infection are with through thorough hand washing and avoidance of recreational water spouts.
water spots. When you or your children have diarrhea, or if you think you or your children may have crypto, see a healthcare provider, medication, and help with fluid loss may be necessary. So these can cause life-threatening complications. Complications can include malnutrition, growth delays, and cognitive impairment, mal- malnutrition, mal- 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 malnutrition, malnutrition, also appears to increase the risk of infection. Crypto is associated with more chronic symptoms and higher mortality rates than other causes of diarrhea in childhood. So thanks for watching, guys. If you are new, make sure to subscribe. I hope you guys enjoy it. Once again, if you enjoyed the video, click on one of these videos to look and learn more about different conditions. And remember, everybody, that if you are watching today's video, make sure to love, make sure to let me know down in the comments if you enjoyed this video, if you learned anything, or if I missed anything that needs to be on this video that is very important to keep in mind with this very serious condition. Let me know down in the comments. And remember, everybody, watch and just, you know, enjoy your life. And remember, guys, stay researching.